Okay. So today, what we'll be doing is, well, today's our last day of a five-day whirlwind introduction into Nalanda debate. So we've gone through the structure. We've gone through the format. We've gone over the essential components of how to conduct a Nalanda debate, how to take any phenomena, any aspect of our universe, internal or external, put it into the form of a logical statement so that you can have a dialogue with someone about it. So we, that structure is here. That structure is what we've been going through and practicing. And so today we'll, we'll take some more time to practice that in this session. We'll review it a bit. Uh, we'll do a little bit of discussion around some questions that have come up in the past, well, primarily since yesterday, as we, we've been taking questions day by day, but there are a few more questions that have come up yesterday. And then we'll kind of do a, you know, a review, not just of what we learned, but of, you know, we'll do, a, a, I guess, more of a brainstorm for how we can continue taking these this skill into our own lives and keep increasing the skill and cultivating it in the future and that may include uh, you know having more course you know more courses or more opportunities to practice debate together with with others um so okay so let's just sort of take stock of everyone who's here if you have any questions that you'd like to have addressed before we kind of start with the planned there's a light on <laughs> before we start with the uh the planned material for today yeah. yeah also if you have any um thoughts or things that you would like to have a discussion about with all of us that we could also um, take those suggestions as well yeah today so today's a good day to just any of confusion that you've had or even just something that you're like hey i wanted to ask about such and such and such issue then now's your chance and we got a couple questions like that yesterday so we'll start we will go with those go into those i wanted to just start at the very beginning though to do a quick review of some of the documents i i, I realize the documents the materials have been coming in a kind of haphazard manner you know coming like throughout the course and putting new ones up and this slack form itself Kind of making you know with several channels and the, the materials all being in different channels was not probably the easiest way to figure out which materials we're using so we apologize for that again this is first time trying something like this you know a lot of the materials we are creating as we go to see what's as we see what's needed and what's helpful so but the good thing is now we have them <laughs> for any future uh debate introduction introductory courses and I appreciate all of your patience for, and it seems like you're you're using them, in the perf you're using them appropriately. You're you're figuring out what is needed when you're actually practicing. So I just want to redirect us. Uh, so I'll do a little share screen. There is one document which uh, isn't essential for. We don't have to go over it right now, but just so you know, it's there. I, it's just been uploaded into the channel five. I'm sorry, day five channel of the Slack forum. So the the day five. And this is just a little bit of some of the other statements or terms that you can use in a debate, which were not part of that essential core structure. You know, take this subject A, it follows that it's B because it's C. The reason, you know, why I accept the reason is not true, no provision. It's not one of those essential core terms, but they come up, they're appropriate, you're allowed to use them. So I just wanted to let you know that document is there. We're not gonna go into it now, you know, unless someone has a question about it, you can look at it, but it's called uh, the language of Nalanda debate number two, additional statements. So that's in day five, okay. And it's just a couple of pages, uh, yeah, three, you know, two and a half pages of kind of extra things, both for the, ch the challenger, the questioner, and for the defender. Okay, then I just wanted to remind everybody that 
you know, the out of all the documents we have, out of all of the materials, so there's some scripts, there's some examples, there's a template, there's that wonderful document created by um, Venerable Chiying, right? Venerable Chiying, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So this uh, excellent graphical document um, with the pervasions and the joints. Uh, and so out of all of those, I just want to emphasize again for learning the format itself we kind of the most essential are this day one structure of debate so that i'm kind of reminding people okay so when you want to kind of sit down and get into a debate what are the most essential things i need to know you need to know how to make a thesis statement how to make a three-part syllogism how to ask a question or statement of pervasion so that's all in this document, day one structure of debate. Um, then day two is helpful to kind of figure out, okay, so now what does it mean when the defender answers in this or that way, right? When they say, I accept, when they say, why? When they say, reason's not true, when they say, no provision. So this is also, I would say, one of the more important ones for just figuring out and getting a better conceptual understanding of how the debate unfolds, what the answers mean, what the questions mean, why you want to keep that structure, and then just, you know, just to remember what the structure actually is. So just wanted to remind people that those two documents are sort of the, the key for the structure of the debate itself, and the rest are all obviously going to be helpful. You can use the scripts, you can look at the examples, etc. Okay, so that was that. So shall we go into some of the questions that came up yesterday? I do want to also just mention, because I don't think I did explicitly, I know, you know, the videos we put up and I hope and expect that people are watching them. So just in case you haven't gotten a chance to see every one of them, because there are many, I, re I realize, and I'll, again, they're kind of scattered throughout the Slack form and different channels, so you might not have even seen them. I understand if that's the case. I mean, seen not even seen the links to them. Um, I realize we don't, we're not putting them publicly on YouTube, so please do not sh share those links. Uh, I should specify the videos that have the animations in them that explain the debate format those ones are just, they're just not ready. Of course, they're going to be made public. That's the whole intention, but they're just not done being edited yet. So if you please would only view them via the links in the Slack form, but not send them out to friends and so forth, we would appreciate that. Uh, all the videos coming from this course, the interviews that are with our guest speakers where, you know, they cover the topics, um, that is fine to share. The guest speakers with the, the input from the experts as the videos are called uh, then the recordings of these sessions of sessions one and two of each day those are all again we still have to figure out exactly why they're not appearing on the youtube homepage, but they're there so they're those are shareable as well we just have to get them we have to organize that page somehow figure that out and then of the of the materials that are written the course materials that were sending with the PDFs, those also you can share. So those things are fine to share, just not the animated videos. So I just wanted to mention though that one where it goes over what Nalanda, the Nalanda tradition itself is, right? And while we're using this word Nalanda debate, just to clarify that the debate format we're using as it's as far as we know, as far as any historians or historical scholars know, it is something that was developed in Tibet in the 12th century by Chaba Chagi uh, and from Sangpu Monastery. So, uh, yeah, just so you know, so Nalanda debate refers to the debate format that comes out of that tradition, but not, not necessarily something that was practiced or developed at Nalanda Monastery itself. So just so you're aware of the historical implications, it's not meant to, as you should say, the term is not meant to be historical um imply the historical you know origins it's it's more meant well just in following really with his holiness the dalai lama's emphasis on referencing this type of logic and this type of reasoning as being part of the nalanda tradition more as the philosophical tradition rather than a specific historical source of all of 
you know, it's not like every single thing talked about in the Tibetan Buddhist monasteries uh, necessarily comes from someone who actually lived in Nalanda. <laughs> Okay, let's see, do we have a question, a general question? Okay, so where should we start with questions? Now, Marika and Stefan, I think each of you had some questions that came up in your debate sessions. Would you like to address those or, or phrase them as, as you understand what they were, and then we can address those, and then I'll get to Boris's question here. Uh, yep, I can give it a try. I thought one question that may be of more general interest here is, um, uh, a question that came up about the role of emotions, because I mean, to what extent, like we said something like, well, you learn to manage your emotions in debate because a lot of strong emotions come up, but then aren't you suppressing your emotions? So, so how does that work? Because we generally also know that suppressing emotions is not a great idea. So, yep, if you could say something about that. I love the question and I love it because it's so relevant to every, to all of us. It's relevant and it's also, you know, a challenge for all, right? It's something that you actually have a question. I mean, that it's a natural, real some question that you really want to know of how to do that, right? We, all, we want to know how to manage our emotions, no doubt. Um, so I guess I would say more or less because of the traditional way that this has been taught, in Tibetan monasteries, as several of the, or at least a couple of our guest speaker, the, the expert debaters mentioned in those videos, I think in the value, the one on the value of debate, that that's not the, I forget which video, I apologize, but they mentioned just debate is not the only thing that people do, monks do, nuns do, in this traditional setting of a Tibetan monastic academy. So what else is there? Well, you're, it, it's a, so just, to, you know, I don't want to have to describe that, you know, spend too much time describing the whole thing, but in the essence of my point being, they're also learning mind training techniques, right? They're also learning just general ethical standards, right? They're also learning about the disadvantages of anger, pride, jealousy, right? So these are sort of part of the larger culture in which debate is practiced in the traditional setting. So I think there has to probably be, or there's a place for, you know, likely a place for really, again, this kind of C learning, social, emotional, and ethical learning to actually be maybe an explicit sort of side lesson when we're learning debate to to really you know remind or instruct if it if you, you know you've never learned it before um people about how to practice patience how what to do when anger arises what to do when arrogance arises and those are specific you know types of uh, mental of mind training with with their own kind of series of reflections and analysis that goes with it i would say a, a more general answer, though, is just you can experience flashes or, I mean, I, I think one of the guest speakers, maybe it was Tenzin Girmi Rinpoche, when he spoke about how, it may have been Gintapke, one of the t Tibetan Geshe's spoke in the video about how, you know, you have this kind of surface reaction or it seems like you're getting angry but really sort of inside on a deeper level you're staying calm even though there's a show of emotion a show of expression so i would even go so far as to say and now of course this may be different because people have different experiences that even beyond being a show of emotion there is some degree of emotion it's just that it's sort of a surface well i kind of rephrased what, 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 Geshe, what the Geshe had said in my own words, but please go and look at the video if you haven't. So my way of thinking of it is there's a surface surface emotion that I could say probably is a bit of, you know, it's excitement, It's there's some emotion there, but the deeper quality of the mind still remains peaceful. So I'm just trying to say that's not a suppression of emotion. That's again, that's a, um, an, a, a certain kind of emotional experience that probably you know, takes some getting used to for figuring out how to maintain a stable level of peace um, in the sort of deeper part of your 
conscious experience while still being able to get up, you know, push someone. I mean, you don't have to push, of course, but the Tibetan monks, the adolescents especially, they do. They're energetic, right? They're, they're like, you know, guys in their teens and 20s. So, you know, push each other around, get jump up, shout without actually having what we would define, you know, the a type of mental state that we would be able to, you know, actually be able to describe that fits the definition of anger, that fits the definition of arrogance. You know, it might just be more of, um, I guess we could say, it's got the energy of those emotions without the confusion of them, so, something like that, without the disturbing quality of them. Sorry, um, so, so oh, America, you're a bit garbled. I'm not sure if other people are having trouble hearing you, but I don't know if you need to go closer to your mic or something. Okay. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, oh, it's you, good now. Can you, okay. Um, so I uh, like one of the things that was very insightful that one of the monks told me was that you know, actually, normally the monks are supposed to behave in a very kind and subdued and peaceful way. And then in the debate quarter, they're actually encouraged to be um, arrogant and vicious. Um, so by virtue of that very specific context where you're expressing these emotions, it, it almost already gives it a bit more of a game-like quality. So you can experiment with these emotions, but realize it's it's sort of just a game and have that thought in the back of your mind, which then maybe in the end will also then eventually translate to how you handle these emotions when they do occur in a more natural real life setting but of course i guess it is a learning process that every monk will probably go through trying to figure out how to best deal with that so. yeah and that's that's probably the best way to summarize it it's 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 a kind of personal learning process and i would just say the key is to stick with it and you know if you notice one day that you're just so flustered or angry and you're just sitting there and you're ruminating about what someone said in a debate then okay well that that will happen well it depends of course on your habits so, you know for some people it might happen more readily than others so yeah and then just use that as that's a good learning so you've learned something from your debate you've learned how easily your mind gets irritated and and upset and and then use that as a chance to think about it think it over okay what it really is the object of my anger what am i what's really the issue here why am i so reacting so strongly to simply you know whatever this person said but yeah like marika said you know this also you know, highlights one of the I guess underlying theories of psychology in the Tibetan and Nalanda tradition is that there's a um, so any sort of practice or action or sort of activity that we engage in, right? It has results, of course, because that's cause and effect of action, which is karma. But how those how that's determined? So sort of the level of goodness versus negativity, if you will, whatever, not the best terminology maybe, but that has to do with not only sort of the nature of the action itself or the nature of the sort of emotional engagement in the activity itself, but with the preceding and sort of primary motivation. So, right, so when we're debating, it's like there's a bigger motivation behind the entire, behind the entire activity, right? This is to eliminate the fundamental misconceptions we have in our minds and to be a better human you know essentially become a, a kinder human being and be able to contribute better in our world so that's the underlying motivation so then as america said right like we are explicitly advised to like get i mean that you know it's funny it's hard to you know say like the words they use you know maybe it's similar words to when we're actually describing people's affliction afflictive emotions like be arrogant but the sense is act like you're arrogant right? it's like not actually like they're not saying develop afflictions <laughs> i mean right now they might they but they do kind of come and go and that's part of the process but so my point being though even if in a process of having this wider bigger motivation and a 
practice or activity where you're working to actualize that motivation, you know, some afflictions come up here and there, it's not going to be the it, it the still the 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 greater good overweighs that essentially that's <laughs> uh, one one way to think of it as well okay cool good question so now a question just came up from boris that's oh there's stefan did you want to say one yeah um regarding questions that came up uh today on on the earlier group um uh marco asked um how was it uh, word by word? Um, how to bring it into daily life would be interesting. And I think that will be uh, content of uh, a bit later anyway. So don't your notes. So I'm not sure if we should um, focus on that right now or maybe uh, focus on it later. And um, one point I think worth mentioning is, um, as Don you just uh, hinted at, is to keep the bigger picture in mind while you're debating at all. And um, that helps um, getting at questions like, um, as a challenger, I ask what's the relation between this concept and that concept, and the defender might reply in a way I did not expect, or that is not true or so. And then as a defender, you as a, sorry, as a challenger, you might ask how to, to work with that what to do with that and that's a very interesting point because you're you're debating because you have some discrepancies between what your uh, debate partner thinks and what you think and that's exactly the point um that's often the reason why you zoom in on something um and Donia, you, would, you, would you like to explain how you would deal with that as a challenger or as a defender when you notice that there is something wrong in this particular setting of the relations between concepts. Like they're giving the wrong answer, basically. Yeah. Well, that's the whole point, right? Like you're saying, the whole point is that there's going to be discrepancies. And, you know, relating this to how to bring it into daily life, well, that's extraordinarily relevant. But we will we'll have, you know, a breakout so it, that we can have a discussion group and people can give their own ideas about that. But just to say one of them is, I mean, again, just look at sort of polarization in terms of sort of, you know, social, you know, views of how society should function or is best, you know, is best guided in terms of um, so policy and so forth. You know, those are extremely polarizing, but they're just views. Right? They're just beliefs. They're just ideas. It's just, I, you know, it's like, take the subject, our society, it follows that, or whatever, you know, the, the econ economic um, the wealth of a society, you know, it follows that it is, you know, it, it, it is able to produce the happiest, you know, largest mass of happy people when it's spread evenly amongst every person in the society, right? You either accept or you don't. I mean, it's, someone might accept it. Someone might not. It's just what you accept or, or say why to. You don't. You don't have to get emotional about it and get worked up and say someone's an enemy because of that, right? So that's like, of course, relevant for sort of larger interactions in society, and then of course, like in whatever area of, of work or where, wherever you are in your life, when you have a disagreement with someone. Um, so then, in the debate. Yeah, I mean, that's, if they don't disagree with you, it's going to be hard to actually debate, you know? Sometimes, okay, yeah, they give the right answer and you just have to, you know, buckle down and say, okay, well, let me be creative and think of a reason why, how I can try to overturn his answer and just get creative and think of something. But oftentimes, more often even, they actually will be saying something that you disagree with or, again, you know, looking at the textual tradition, a lot of things are purpose, purposely, let me emphasize, not clear or ambiguous. Well, why is that ambiguity there? Because you can read something and get different ideas about it, right? Someone can read the Dudra text and say, oh, well, cloud color is a secondary color, so that must mean that all cloud color, you know, if something is a cloud color, it's necessarily a secondary color. Someone else might read that and say, no, 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 it's just talking about the cloud colors, which are secondary colors, like 
you know, orange cloud colors and black cloud cl cloud colors and so forth. So, right, there's ambiguity. Now, I should say different texts make that more or less clear than others, but that's just one example. But um, the ambiguity allows it so that two different people can read the same material and come away with two different understandings. So then you have something you're able to debate about, right? You have actually different views and you're still asserting the view of the text. <laughs> you're not necessarily deviating from the text either way. And then um, when it comes to an experiment, for instance, a scientific experiment, and we see this is, you know, again, I think quantum physics is not, maybe not, the, certainly not the only example, but maybe one of the best known, uh, just how many interpretations of quantum mechanics there are, when everyone agrees on the results of the experiments. No one, no one has, dis oh, I can't say no one, but there's not large scale disagreement among, you know, about whether an exp certain given experiment is valid or not, or done properly or not, the the debates are about what it implies about the nature of particles, about the nature of physical phenomena, right? So, yes, there's um, a lot of room for debate. So then what to do is just, yeah, you assert your reason. <laughs> if, if someone says why to a statement that they should be, or you think they should be accepting, well, ask them for the reason that they have, so you can get a sense of where they're coming from, and then give your reason for why they're not right, you know, just like that. Cool, so I had another question. Any more questions that are coming up now, feel free to, okay, Marlena has one, and then please go ahead. Sorry, and, and just one follow-up statement. I think maybe this is exactly why debate helps you to see things from many different angles because the other person might have a different idea or um, reason for things. And then you can say, okay, well, so if they think that, then, you know, um, it follows that this, then it follows that that. Is that logical? Okay, well, maybe I don't find that logical, but okay, let's let's move on. And then you just see like, well, what are the reasons for holding this particular position and to what extent is it reasonable? And then of course, again, still like here we had this def these definitions of colors and the defender might be uh, agreeing with that and follow that. And another time you might be like, no, I don't like that if you're the defender and I'm gonna take a different position. I'm gonna phrase it in terms of wavelengths and then that's my position. And then you can also both see like what follows from that. And then slowly you, you're you uh, able to appreciate maybe these different points of view. Yeah, and, and you learn so much. And, you know, that's why this is, you know, a, a very effective learning aid. And not just for learning material that's already established, but it could even be, you know, hope, you know our hope is it could be used for people who are actively at like the forefront of their research and actually use it to develop new knowledge, right? <laughs> to make discoveries. And it sort of is that way, right? That's, you know, it's put that way in some of the, the those videos that go over the kind of background of the Nalanda tradition, but just to re re restate that, you know, knowledge itself is something that has to be, or you know, according in, in, in this way of thinking about knowledge, something that has to be rediscovered by each individual human being. So simply having someone else have made an incredible discovery, wrote, write it in a book or tell you about it and you hear or read about it, that does not mean you have knowledge of it. That's not what knowledge means. Knowledge means that you understand something to the, to the point that you're able to completely overcome any misconceptions about it and not have any room for doubt, not have any, not have anyone be able to give you a reason that would cause you to doubt it. There has to be this 100% total assuredness, which is based on understanding the, the background reasons. That's the only way you can get that 100% assuredness. You know, this is why His Holiness, just for the Buddhists, just quickly say His Holiness the Dalai Lama always emphasizes you know, having this, the need for using reasoning in order to establish, for instance, selflessness and emptiness, right? So you can get this convict, he, he uses the English word and when he's speaking in English, conviction. So I would say just a doubt-free ascertainment or a doubt-free cognition, right? Doubt-free doubt -free co cognition. So, okay. Now the question from Boris and then we'll get to Marlene, Mar Marlena or Marlena, I'm not sure, but 
Hope you don't mind whichever one, <laughs> Marlena, if I say. Okay, so Boris first. A general question on the convention of categories. I'm sorry if it's redundant. When a category contains both, ergo permanent and impermanent items, is the category itself ergo permanent or impermanent? Awesome question. So I love Boris's questions, and he really can see how much he's, he's studying and has a good background in this material. So... So, so we didn't go into a real discussion of what it means to be a permanent phenomena, what it means to phenomenon, what it means to be a functioning thing or impermanent phenomenon. And because that's you know that would be that would have to be its own sort of lesson, right? It's, that would be kind of that would that would take time to explain and go into, but it is important as I mentioned, right? Because it's sort of built into the debate format itself, some recognition that there exist phenomena which are not observable by your senses. That's like the sort of, the, that's the whole point of logic, actually. If everything that existed and could be known was observable by your senses, we would never need to reason, right? Reasoning is only to let us know about those things which we can't see or hear or smell, taste or touch. So, I guess the 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 easiest way to answer that is just by saying if something well the easy way is just by saying yes <laughs> it follows that right if you make a statement of provision if a category contains both permanent and impermanent phenomenon it, it phenomenon it is necessarily permanent that's just the simple answer and then if you have more questions about why that might be we can discuss those those later maybe don't want to spend the whole time talking about that question because other people will be kind of no, they need more a lot of other people will need more background to get a fuller discussion about it in a, in a kind of meaningful way so Mar Mar marlena i'll just guess can you come up and give me a question Um, yeah, it's the Malina is correct, uh, but yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I would like to come back to uh, uh, what we talked before uh, on the emotion part, and I uh, thank you very much already for your elaboration on that. That already helped a lot. Um, I, st I still have the feeling that um, we talked a lot about um, manageable emotions and um, emotions that are. Uh, are encouraged as long as they are, are manageable in a way. Um, and I was wondering what it is or how in regard to like more um, like, like existential emotions, um, this applies as well. So for example, there's like some very deep political pain, some certain uh, societal group is in because of their voice not being heard and dismissed um, if we like I, I would I would uh, hesitate to say that they have to manage their emotions because their emotions are actually a way to um, to get them heard in, in the first place so I was wondering if you can say something to that and how how there would be a way to yeah to use uh, the validity of these emotions as well in a debate and how to make them, um, yeah, to give them a voice or make them more valid also in this logic debate. Well, that's a very, very profound question. Um, I don't have a kind of universal way to answer it that would really be appropriate for every situation i don't think i would just i'll just say one you know something brief and america also please comment if, if, you, if you'd like to so you know in general having emotions right emotion let me put it this way when we use the word emotion what are we really talking about are we talking about simply a felt experience, what we could call some some mental state with an affect valence, affect an affective quality, some kind of either positive or neutral or negative sort of you know 
felt experience. Uh, are we talking only about that? Or are we also talking about that together with a certain kind of cognitive perspective, what we could call a sort of, you know, cognitive appraisal of a situation where we're judging it to be a certain way, whether, and, and I'm not just talking as simply, simply as good or bad, that's like too simplistic, but really kind of the way we relate to it. So for instance, are we relating to my, you know, my, my mother or friend in our mind as if they are a permanent entity person that's going to last forever or are relating, relating to them and thinking of them as something that's disintegrating every moment that we see them. So that's a cognitive component that comes together with the emotions we have about them. The cognitive, the cognitive way of appraising something or relating to it is going to influence the affective quality of the, the positiveness, the arousal, the, the, the joy level, <laughs> joy level, I mean, the, 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 the goodness of the, emo, um, the felt experience or the, the negativity and darkness of it. So they're related, but we have to draw a distinction. And this is something that the Nalanda psychology is, is really amazing for, that it's able to draw this distinction, which Western psychology and sort of culture at large doesn't have as clear way of doing. But my, my point being, emotion in the sense of simply having deep sorrow because of a real situation that's actually occurring, there's nothing... You know, that's something that, as you say, can be an inspiration to act to change it. It can be an inspiration to develop greater empathy and compassion with others in similar situations. It can be inspiration or a cause to simply have a deeper understanding of things, right? So in debate, how does that, so then that's, a, so then how does that come into the debate is sort of the next part of the question, but just in general. So those things are um are fine now the 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 way i guess i would say in terms of whether we're debating or not but simply how to understand those emotions in a productive way i, I could say would be that you try you know make an effort to frame them or have a way of you know holding them with your sort of intelligence and the mind the conceptual mind that's able to make, make analysis and understand things better do that in a way that you're not over exaggerating um in the sense of okay this is a really terrible situation but is everyone that's involved in sort of holding this group of people in the position they're in or you know keeping them silenced the way they are is everyone involved in there like a hundred percent evil and terrible and you know, sort of wor a worthy object of, you know, hatred, basically, right? Are they re really a worthy object of hatred? Do I re is the world really going to be better if every one of them were to have their heads chopped off and their eyes pulled out? It's like, which is the way that emotions can, you know, the emotion combined with a certain cognitive perspective will think that, will feel that, right, with a certain kind of appraisal. You know, I hate you. I hate you, right? That's <laughs> cognitive appraisal. But you can have a set deeply sad emotion, or disappointed, or um, suffering emotion while having compassion for the people perpetrating a situation. So I would just say, in general, that would be something to aim for, and that also, you know, right, with a trauma, with a deep trauma, that's not easy. That's something where. I mean, this is like why His Holiness the Dalai Lama, along with Sophie Langri of our videos, along with count, you know, dozens and dozens and hundreds of educators who are working to create an actual curriculum that can be taught to children across the world in regular schools about how to do exactly this, how to really manage difficult emotions in day-to-day -day life. Um, and so there's a real, I mean, that's, you know, a whole you know, 12 years, you know, a whole course starting from kindergarten going up through college, right? It's not a simple thing.
But Marika, would you say anything? Yeah, so um, I mean, one uh, bit of an addition is I would say there there is for many of these emotions we're talking about, like anger, it, it actually has a deeply activating quality and arousing quality that's very powerful. It's a very powerful way to communicate. The problem becomes when you're angry and it becomes just about you and your emotion. If you're angry and you have what we call some amount of metacognition, so you still see the whole situation and you see others' point of view um, and others' perspective, then maybe you can use that to communicate very powerfully, like, this is not cool. Um, and uh, of course the person is not gonna like it probably, but then you are also maybe able to provide some, uh, some reason and you're just uh, able to keep the emotion short as one uh, wonderful um, Tibetan Buddhist teacher, Kandra Rinpoche likes to say. And I think that that's a good way to think about it. So have on the one hand, emotion is a very powerful communication tool and especially anger because it has this cutting through quality. Um, but if you're then getting completely caught up in it, I mean, in uh, psychology, there's also this term of perseverative cognition. It's mostly used to refer to persisting in ruminative thinking, which also doesn't go anywhere. But I would imagine that also similar um, uh, kind of processes are going on with anger, for example, or addiction. So I would say that that's where um, uh, that's the problem. It's not the emotion itself, and, and the emotion itself can be extremely useful and powerful um, because then you can also be a, but a lot more um, um, useful. So I, I mean, just to uh, end with one uh, example that just occurred this week. So um, my PhD student and I we had uh, a terrible review on an uh, academic paper we submitted, and it was really not thought through. This this reviewer just said like. Um, the results are unclear and the methods are unclear and uh, the language is bad and well, basically just that and didn't give any substantial argument. So the first inclination was to send uh, a message back like this is a terrible review and the reviewer should be uh, banned from <laughs> reviewing or whatever. But that's not really going to make an impact, right? So if you are then able to channel that anger to say, okay, I'm going to write a, a message back because this is really not not good, I mean, for the academic system, but I'm going to actually support it with arguments rather than just the emotion, then the message actually becomes much more powerful. And similarly, if you're angry, but you're also able to see how it um, arrives at the person, you're maybe able to communicate more skillfully so the person doesn't just go completely in the defensive mode and feels attacked and not um, feels... Um, interested in changing their behavior, which is really your objective most of the time with anger. Yeah, and so we, we say... Oh. Yeah, thank you very much for clarifying that. I think uh, that uh, encompassed a lot more of um, the emotion aspect. Thank you. And just to use the more typical terminology of Nalanda psychology, so, and I'll say it in a, in, in a statement of provision, if something is an emotion, it is not necessarily an afflictive emotion. And the way to make that distinction is, again, well, just recognizing, as we say, if something, in a statement of provision, if something is a mental state, right, if something is an afflictive emotion, or a disturbing emotion, or a destructive emotion, all those being Kind of synonymous. If something is a destructive emotion, then it's necessarily got a sort of tunnel vision, just more or less. <laughs> so that's um, way to, one way to think of it. So then the way to work with that would be to always be trying to just think, you know, really bring up your analytical mind and say okay what really is the larger situation what really is the larger uh, thing going on with this person what really would make this situation better rather than just lashing out and killing everyone i think made it happen right? <laughs> destroy them not not that and in terms of debate because you did ask that i would say really the way i can think of right now you may might be meaning something else but how to you know that you, how your question relates to debate, I would just say in terms of 
the actual subjects that you're debating about to spend some time learning about psychology and debating about that spend some time learning about you know, emotions and anger and um, the different types of constructive and destructive emotions and then using those as your topics to debate about and that will make it more clear that will, that will get them more clear how to sort of the different the minds different ways of making cognitive appraisals and how th that process goes okay then we had one question from sam but i don't think he's here he yes he sent it yesterday i don't think he is here right now so i'll wait and see if he's here in the second session before addressing it but it's a good question and now some other hand of andrew is up so Let's take it. For taking my question also, it's more of a follow up to the earlier discussion because we, you guys spoke a lot about the, the mentality or metacognition or meta awareness, whatever your favorite terminology is, as far as in debate attitudes, in debate perspectives, in debate mental states. But what about? post-debate mental states, post-debate research. I mean, debate is an activity that is a transferable skill to all academic research. And as I was said earlier, you know, people become extraordinarily competitive. People are in the academic space willing to chop heads and eyeballs and whatever else. And it can be harmful. I mean, there's one thing to be detriment detrimental to somebody's career, but it's another thing to be detrimental to that internal person self-esteem kind of thing so how there's only this far that lojong can get you unless you're like shanti dev or whatever else there's only this far that lojong can get you in that sort of competitive academic space so what do you suggest as a coping mechanism for those kinds of losses i mean i'm speaking more of like macro debate losses not you know you said at the courtyard and you got an argument refuted or something but something that is more uh, significant as far as the development of a career is concerned well i'll let the academic address this one <laughs> well yeah this was an open question to, to anyone so um well, I would say that from my perspective, um, of course, this is just an opinion. Um, uh, I think that the fact that this kind of debating, you practice sort of playing around with different perspectives and even playing around with these, you know, emotions and competition in a safe space in a way because you both agree it's a game in any moment you can just step out and say hey um you know i i think this or uh, how do we do that and you're 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 competing but you're also being friends and so because you practice that kind of mental state i think it automatically will influence how you cope with the world out there but i would say also say that for me personally, what's been extraordinarily helpful as an academic in uh, issues related to my career is really going back to my Buddhist practice and especially these concepts of um, uh, impermanence and interdependence that Dunya also mentioned earlier in this session to realize that, you know, at the moment of death, what is this really about? You know, it actually becomes pretty insignificant and, and these emotions do go. And, just contemplating on those things, I, I found very, very helpful um, uh, in that context. Perfect. Yeah, that was a very satisfying answer. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Mary. Um, oh, Claudio, you have a question now? Okay, come up. That's fine. All right, so and I'll be very brief because what Andrew said and, and what Marike was uh, echoing feels really uh, strong. So I, like, uh, I am an academic publisher, I work for an academic publisher, and the topic of, uh, um, let's say, the, the, the stress dynamics and the competitive dynamics, you know, also familiar in the corporate world, for instance, or in other words, uh, in recent years, uh, in my, in my view, view is increasing so, so much, much, right? There's so much in the academic world, but to the point that sometimes it's even spoiling the level of research that is being uh, that is being done. So if, this is not really a question, but if anyone would be interested uh, in, in, 
in, in the future to have a conversation about that. I, I, it resonates very much with me. It doesn't necessarily resonate with the publisher I represent, actually. I don't know, because uh, I haven't explored it yet. But to me, it's a huge uh, topic. So in, in essence, is suffering in the academic world. <laughs> Uh, so is that something that should be addressed? And is that something that, who are the players for? for I'll stop it right there because I want to steer the discussion, but I wanted to take the opportunity to say it because there's so many competent people. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Yes, that's a big difficulty. And I don't have much to say about it myself because I am not and have never been in Involved that I'm not an academic and I don't know the culture of academia other than from third person reporting. So I don't know, but um, I guess I can just say that the long term vision that I will bring up one more time <laughs> of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and his collaborators in creating a formal structure for the world's students, you know, not just in, you know, little pockets of these kind of specialty programs or Missouri schools or something everywhere in the world for people to really learn um, how to manage and regulate your emotions and develop a greater sense of unity with the whole of the human, you know, collection, the, the whole of the human family, you know, in that, in the, in the sense of brotherness and, you know, sisterhood that comes together with that that would naturally change a lot of these issues, I think. And um, I'm sure academia is not the only place where these issues come, you know, all over our society, modern society. But thank you for that comment. And I feel for you. <laughs> okay, cool. And now we have a link. Oh, should you? I think America only posted that link. You, um, yeah, there you go. Okay. Thank you. So now everyone has that. Wonderful. So. Well, now we've come to an hour without, is it, okay, the hand is still up, but I think that's just from before. So what we should do really, what we, I would like to do is review, review the material that we've gone over this week. Now we've tried to have kind of segments of talking for 20 to 30 minutes and then going into groups for 20 minutes or so. And we've just gone almost an hour talking, of course, nice. It was very nice we had Q&A so but why don't we have some time to break out into groups and because my goal for this session was to do review why don't we have the groups be our sounding board with your with the people in your groups so just go through those documents especially like I said day one and day two we're gonna review okay what are the types of questions that we can ask in a debate what does it mean to be a thesis? What's, what composes a thesis? What are the three parts of a syllogism? What does it mean for a reason to be a flawless reason or to be a valid reason? What does it have to say about the subject? What does it have to say about the predicate? What does it have to, how does it have to relate to the subject? How does it have to relate to the predicate? So go through these materials. So. I mean, I think it would be good to just do it together as groups. We could do it all together. Um, I don't know if someone has a preference. Maybe, America, if you have an idea about which you would like, but. I would say it's nice to do in smaller groups, just get in, into smaller groups. And, and rather than starting with the documents, I would start with your memory. So see like what you still remember about what we talked about this week and then um, add to each other. So maybe if you go into groups of four or five or so and then make also, also make, try to make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak um, because I think um, multiple know more than one basically. Yeah, and so good point, right? Don't start looking at the documents. I'm just trying to say going through what the material was presented in those documents and you can go back to them if you can't, if no one in your group can remember. But so those are the general, the questions to be asking each other. What do you remember about what are the types of questions? What are the appropriate responses? What is a syllogism composed of? How does the reason have to relate to the subject and the predicate? What are the different joints before? List them out. And what does each of them contain? 
right? Okay, so uh, those are the kinds of questions to be to to be asking each other. And let's break out groups of four or five, and I'll call you back. And so we have at least a few minutes before the end of the session. I'll call you back and um, yeah, we have 20 minutes. Okay, yeah, we can have 20 minutes for that. Okay, ready, set, break. Someone's in a monsoon. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. There was like lots of white noise. Was it from me? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the cause of disturbance. Okay. Fixed. <clears throat> so who? Who would like to challenge? Because I, I, I think from memory I can just defend a little bit. Yeah, would you like to challenge? <laughs> right at the heart of a lot of craziness right now. Not very, not very. Ani, Kiran, Kiran, Kapar Yure. Ah, Tanda? Tanda, yeah. Ah, Nepal. Oh, awesome. Pay up for you. Kiran, Kapar Yure. France. Oh, France, thank you. Labo, thank you. You are French? Yes. Oh, pay up. Are you Australian? Australian, yeah. I got it. I got it. Hello, Danielle. We are just practicing some of it. Let's go. Soon, Dan, we can make it just here on our. Oh, let's go. Ani, thank you. Thank you. What What do you remember? Well, Joe, you remember a lot of things, but from the focus. Yeah. Okay. I try because I'm the least experienced, so I just go and get hammered. <laughs> It's why this is. I, I think I, I got your point, and I totally agree. Yeah. And I, I think um, this is also something. You know, it was not so clear if it's really uh, required to do the what we what we call counting debate before the logic debate, um, or if you can inter intertwine these, um, because you know. So as a defender, when you're required to defend the textbook tradition, then it's clear. But in our context, so like in a worldly context, um, you don't know what the opponent is really holding. So you try to find out. 
And sometimes it's tricky, like for the graffiti or whatever, what it's really his ideas are. And um, like it starts with form, and from form it kind of branches into the various aspects of uh, external form, internal form. From there, it goes more deeper and deeper. And from there, you can then, based on your debate, take it, if you go correctly, which I'm still struggling with, but if you, you can then go into the logic debate, starting with the counting debate. Does anyone else want to add anything? Claudio Bia. I lost connection, so I I don't I didn't hear what you say. So we said we start with the counting debate. Mm -hmm. and counting debate is basically giving us the basis to get our concepts clear in terms of definition and in terms of the branches. So uh, we have one branch which is form, and then from there it takes into internal form, external form. What are the internal forms? What are the external forms? And then you have more and more branches that kind of you can go into. And from there, you go into a logical debate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a math debate. You know. debate. That's what the basis is for understanding debate and taking it from there to go into deeper, where you can go into logic debate and provisions and um, yeah. Shape. Uh, she. That form, that which is suitable as as a form and not included with the continuum of a person that is included uh, as a substratum of form and not included within the continuum of a person So, um, yeah, and then from what I remember, and this is where I was looking, I was actually looking at the book, you know, the physical word, and then there's, if you have the book, uh, I, I actually um, look at um, the, 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 how they introduced the, the training in the training in logical uh, reasoning, and uh, it's really stated, like, you would... Um, use this to go through the your own statement, the refutation, and and um, no the the statement statement of others, your own statement, and then the refutation, and then it's explained with very very concise way the what uh, what how you use this syllogism of the subject, the predicate, and 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 uh, the. Um, they call the proof for the reason. So this is the basis you need to understand. So hopefully yeah, yeah, I got yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's like the most important thing. If you don't understand that, then it's... Then it's out of the window. So this is really that I'm still at, you know, this, this stage of even though reading through and trying to practice as much as possible is really making sure that this is 
anchored in the brain that you need to build this, uh, this tree and then you need to build the thesis otherwise you're not going anywhere into the into the reasoning so there's something that you need to to to, to state first a subject yeah. and then you you open it's 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 like when we do the the counting debates we open there's an opening so you open something you build a base and then once you're comfortable you go there what i remember is that we do the counting debate You could answer his question. But that it's a debating session, or it's a session to actually review what we have gone through. Yeah. That, that's just just the point I'm trying to make. But no. y'all can carry on. <laughs> So, so that's why I said I've spoken enough. So if you guys want to to jump in for something else, I mean I'm more than happy to listen to your voices also. So yeah. So should we maybe take some some uh, review some logic debate? Okay. Uh, the cloud colors. Same size or the same amount. It can be a definition, which is the same, would be the same uh, entity actually, but it's phrased in another way so that it makes it clearer to the other person. Yeah. Right. But it's an inclusion of three circles. It's quite easy if you have a vendor who draws you three circles and have a subject, the inner one, right. and the reason the middle one and the. Uh, so the smallest, one. smallest circle is the subject. Yeah, then, yeah. then the next circle is the reason, and it, the yeah. outermost circle is the predicate. Yeah, so it's quite clear. So the subject must be included in the reason test. Otherwise, the reason doesn't make sense, and you can say the reason is not established or it's not true. And if, okay. 
and, and the reason must be included in in, in, the, in, the, in all the, the predicates uh, or the, in the predicate. Otherwise, there's no operation or the reason uh, doesn't. Um, so the the reason is not included in the predicate. So then there would be no operation. There is no operation. Yeah, it's really. Otherwise, you can't ask the question, no provision. Provision of what? Because the, 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 the reason has been asked. Yes, yeah, you cannot, you cannot, but this is the relation in, in terms of uh, three points, four points, or, or, or contradiction. If not, if you don't have the reason, you cannot ask that, I assume. Yeah. That's not even my understanding was. Yeah. But the, the question remains valid to me. Huh? Like, uh, uh, so e even with the three part reasoning, then how do you get from there into the exploring the provisions? I, I, I'm also a little bit confused uh, there. What if you jump into that little world of provisions? And exactly. Then... Is my question out there is is there a set, is there a formula from where you go into that? Yeah. Well, yeah, we're starting with can you posit a relationship between A and B in terms of equivalence, contradiction, three joints, four joints? So I think you first need to establish what your subject and predicate are, which would be A and B, I think. And then once you get that relationship, then you can have your three-part syllogism. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So, so if 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 an uh, subject and the predicate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can can you can you repeat? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Take the subject, uh, debate. Yeah, it follows that uh, you can have a debate uh, just with a subject and a predicate. I accept. You accept? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, uh, take the subject, uh, debate. It follows that um, we can uh, have an entire debate. Uh, without expressing a reason. Why? Okay, take the subject, um, uh, debate. Uh, it follows that if you accept my uh, predicate, then we are having a debate without a reason. Take the subject, debate. If you accept. Well, if I accept, I contradict myself. <laughs> I don't want to do that because I'm a very proud person. <laughs> but I have to leave my emotions aside. So, yeah, okay, I accept. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a very good practical example. <laughs> And another way that you could actually ask this, and there's a whole series of lessons, you know, this is one of the lessons gone through in the collected topics. You probably know those of you studying that. So, you know, the, the lesson on what are the different types of syllogism or consequence, right? If the tell, tell, right? So, tell your, tell your genome shop. So, yeah, there are, it's, it's totally fine to have a syllogism with just the two branches of a subject and a predicate. Yeah, it doesn't need to have a thought. Yeah. But then it's not a reasoning. It doesn't. If it's not a, if it, uh, like, how can you, you can't have it sourced from if you don't have a reason, right? You can't have it sourced. Sourced. You can't have the three. Sourced. No, no. You right. No, it wouldn't have sourced. But it's a talgir. It's it's considered a talgir. So it's not tayanda tayanda maris. It's not a. It's not a. Um, a flawless reason or a flawless syllogism, but it's, it is a, this is where in English, the way we're presenting it here, we're not making that much of a distinction between a proof statement, 
you know, a syllogism and then a, uh, a consequence. We're just saying syllogism, syllogism, but actually there are various types of logical statements. So anyway, you can have a, you can have a consequence with only those two branches, but you cannot have a, a proof statement or a syllogism. So you cannot have a Tagjo Yandak or a Dunga Yandak, but you can have a Telgir. Uh, okay. It wouldn't be a Telgir Yandak, but it would be a Telgir. <laughs> okay. Yeah, very Just, just calling to give the two-minute warning, so no, you don't have to leave immediately, so about two minutes left, so kind of lead, lean in towards your conclusion. Thank you. <clears throat> Say why? Does not have a mind. Um, that might have something to do with that. Like if yeah, you can yeah. say you know, maybe that the lemon is not the flower, but the lemon is the flower thing. Um, which yeah, it's. Exists as a place in Moscow. Uh, no pervasion. What no pervasion? If it exists uh, in Moscow, it doesn't follow. It is a common law. It is the red and square. Okay, take the red square. It is a square. It is a place in Moscow. It is a place in Moscow. I accept. Okay, so take the red square. It is. Think of some. Okay, so let's now try and wrap up and come back into the temple. Okay, great. So it sounds like people learned a lot. You guys are really, really excellently going through the material. There's still some questions. There's certainly a few things that, you know, aren't totally clearly clear yet. And I'll just say from my experience, which, which is shared universally and has been mentioned by some of the guest speakers and the, the videos that are on YouTube, it takes a long time to learn this skill and get really comfortable with it. That's all. So, you know, being in the traditional setting, learning how to debate by studying the collected topics, usually people don't really get a good sense of how to do the pervasions and what it really means and, you know, just how to carry on the whole, everything we learned today, how to put it all together and make a clear, you know, A to Z debate, connecting the dots in between, you know, it, 
I don't want to give a def, you know, there's no definite, but maybe generally, let's say it takes roughly a month. And this is with daily debating. <laughs> so um, this is day, this is debating every day for two to four hours a day, you know, five, six days a week for a month. So, you know, it's, it's um, something that actually you guys are all doing incredibly well, considering, you know, a four day crash course, where we only practiced about you know a third of the time of that course anyway so very very good very good to see and so any let's see any other comments from St stefan or america no okay so let's just go over together really quickly and like if we could have one person come on stage because normally i would just ask the class and i could just hear your responses you would, you would shout them out but since we can't do it that way with the setup here then if one person could just come up to represent the class and I'll just ask you the questions and you try your best to answer them. And, you know, if you don't feel confident that you would get all of them 100% correct, don't worry about it. That's the point. We're just reviewing, the, but making sure that everyone, you know, has a general sense of sort of the right direction and kind of what what kinds of things that we, you know, wanted to make sure people came out of the course with. So let me see, if I don't get a volunteer, I'll call on someone, I'll give you 10 seconds to raise your hand. <laughs> okay, I'll close my eyes and just pick one name on the screen. And I have, oh, okay, we got a volunteer. Good, <laughs> is that what that is? Yes, Marco, good job. <laughs> Marco has a lovely green dress on today. <laughs> okay, so Marco, let me it's ask easy. you. Oh, so, <laughs> Thank you. Good. So let's let's see. So we'll just go through sort of from the start on day one, what we began with and kind of go down. So Marco, and I'll even put it in debate terminology. It follows that, you know, you can posit the two different types of debate. I accept. What are they? Uh, counting debate and logical debate. Take the subject counting debate and logic debate. Follows those are the two types of debate. I accept. And can you posit the purpose of counting debate? Uh, the, hmm. You can just go I, like to... I, I accept. I accept. Okay. What's what's your thought on it? Posit it. I'm not sure if I just spoke in a lie. <laughs> if I can. Uh, okay. What's the purpose of, of counting debate? It's. Um, to to find out the the the, hmm, the different categories of, of one thing yeah Maybe so to, to find out the categories and even more generally just to establish a common framework for the challenger and defender okay. for the question and answer mm -hmm. yeah but by by right how do you do that by laying out the, the different categories and definitions of things exactly good mm -hmm. so and what are the kinds of questions? So take the subject count, counting debate. It follows that it is done by using uh, either the open-ended questions or the logic questions. Mm, logic questions. Logic questions. Uh, so, 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 uh, except. Okay, or, which need to accept. Okay, which one of them? Uh, logic questions. Logic questions. Oh, he, uh, here it's more the open-ended questions because you're just asking, oh. can you posit? That's like an open-ended question is posit yeah. the definition of yeah. color, posit the division of color. So those are the open-ended ones. Why are they open-ended? Because the answerer or defender, he just she just can okay. say anything that they want. They don't have to either say accept, why, no pervasion, the reason is not true. They don't have to use one of these four restricted answers. So that's why we're saying they're open-ended. Good. And so then after accounting debate, right? Then so it follows that, you, right? So after accounting debate, you begin a logic debate. So can you posit the, you know, the fundamental structure, the fundamental kind of statement in a logic debate? So there is, uh, uh, I accept. Posit it. Uh, there's two, two types. One one uh, statement of thesis and one statement of pervasion. Good. Take the subject, the statement of thesis and statement of pervasion. It follows. Those are the two kinds of questions in a logic debate. I accept. 
Okay, the two kinds of questions in a logic debate, statement of pervasion, statement of thesis, and then mm -hmm. can you posit the answers that would be appropriate, one, the two answers that are appropriate for either of those two kinds of questions? Um, the, the, the answers I accept. Okay, positive. Positive okay. those answers. Uh, I accept. So then... Yeah, positive. Positive. Yeah, positive. Uh, I think one one answer is uh, to give a reason. So not yet. Is... So if you just if the, if it's just the statement, it follows that if something is the color mm -hmm. white, it's necessarily a primary color. Now you say one then, of two things, or what are the two options? Uh, one is to I accept, and the other option is. Um, why? Why? I accept and why? Good. So those are the two. I accept why? and why? Well, well, prove it. well, so prove it comes if I give a reason. So if now let's move yeah. into. So those are the thesis questions and mm -hmm. the statements of pervasion. Now we move into a reason. So the reason is part of right. This really this is the kind of fundamental structure of a debate is now this thing with three parts. What is that? Can you posit the the term for this? Three-part logical statement. Um, this is the uh, yes. Okay. What what is that? Yeah. How's it? Uh, subject, predicate, and reason. Subject, predicate, reason, and those three together make up. What is that? Uh, called? The, those three. Those three. Those together. three make up the three-part syllogism. Three-part syllogism. Good. So a syllogism. This is our. You know the the main structure for how to make a debate you have your subject you have your predicate you have your reason so that's a three-part mm -hmm. syllogism good so that's you know that's day one right that was the three-part syllogism and then oh what are the answers sorry the answers that you give after a reason so take the subject the color white it follows that it is a primary color because it's suitable as a primary hue now what do you and say if you're the answer if you don't accept, prove sorry. it. Prove it, or if, you don't, if I don't accept, prove it or no pervasion. No pervasion. Prove it or no pervasion, right? So, those are the two answers. Now, what does that mean? Well, we can just move into regular. I'll just ask you because we're mm -hmm. actually out of time already. No, but what does it mean to say prove it? Or also, we could say the reason is not true. The reason is not established. So prove it means that the other person needs to give some more. Well, to give an example or to, to make an illustration of what he just said and make it clear what he means. And by this, like proving proving his point. So how, and, and so why does he need to prove his point? Exactly right. He needs to prove his point because what the answer it's, is now saying, the reason actually it was not true of that subject, right? So mm -hmm. that's why he wants you to prove it, right? So if you say, take the subject, the color of a white cloud, it follows that mm -hmm. it's a secondary color because it's suitable as a secondary hue. Mm -hmm. I say prove it. That means that mm -hmm. I'm I'm not accepting that the color of a white cloud is suitable as a secondary hue. That was the reason. I'm saying it's not true mm -hmm. of that subject. So now you have to give another reason. Again, like you're saying, to prove that it actually is. So you would say it's suitable as a secondary hue because it is suitable as the color of a cloud or something like that, right? Okay, which is a division of secondary colors, okay? So something like that. And now if you say no pervasion, what does it mean? I'm not, not fully fully convinced by the argument. <clears throat> maybe I'm not <clears throat> Maybe I'm not fully right. um, uh, not believing, but uh, at least I'm not uh, f uh, completely sold on the argument. Right. Right. That's why you would say okay. prove it because you're not sold on it. That's right. Right. That's what happens. And just, I mean, that's why th that phrase, it's it's a very colloquial phrase, but that's what it is. Right. Someone gives you some reason and you go, I don't believe you prove it. Right. <laughs> so now what if you say no pervasion? That is not a colloquial expression, but it should become one. And in Tibetan society where students uh, even lay society, ordinary society, where a lot of people do learn this debate format in their secular education, they do use this phrase. And it's quite fun to hear people having a regular conversation and all of a sudden they go, no provision, no provision. <laughs>
My mom and brother now um, do it I as, I, as I've been debating for with with them occasionally. <laughs> I think it's not not logically it, uh, the subject and the predicate not logically uh, 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 connect. The reason, yeah, they, there's the no reason. logical connection, but it's between the reason and the predicate, right? The reason and the predicate. The reason and the predicate. Mm -hmm. So an example would be: take the subject, the color of a white cloud. It follows that mm -hmm. it's a secondary color because it's mm -hmm. the color white. Oh, okay. There's no it, connection. It, yeah, it no connect correlation. because white is a primary color. Right. If something's the color white, it isn't necessarily a secondary color. There's no mm. correlation, right? Mm. Actually, it's necessarily not a secondary color. So, so okay. Mm -hmm. So now we're actually over time a couple minutes, and that was, you know, I, I, that was a very good review. Thank you so much, Marco. That was very, uh, very well done, oh, and and I hope everyone else is, is sitting in your respective seats shouting out the answers together with Mark, Marco <laughs> just as it would be if we were live. Okay. I now, was wearing my lucky skirt today. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to break for 90 minutes and <clears throat> thank you, Stefan, for that. And if anyone, if you want to say any comment before we break and we'll come back. So everyone, please return for our last session. And that's one we're really going to. So we just reviewed. If you have a couple more questions that came up from your group, your little powwows, please bring them. But mainly we're going to be discussing um, what to do. So how to bring this into your daily life and how to continue this skill, practicing this skill, which again, can involve a little bit of, you know, brainstorming maybe of, or what just hearing different people's interests so we can see if okay maybe we can try and create some other opportunities for practicing debate that's um, certainly something we can discuss okay great so everyone have a good break and we'll see each other back here in 90 minutes